Well, it's good to uh, see all of you and be here. Um, for those of you that have shown an interest in my health, I want you to know I'm feeling much better than I was two weeks ago at this time. Um, and I'm grateful for your prayers. Uh, I received excellent medical care. Um, I do think that it would have been kind of exciting to go out of this world preaching a sermon on heaven. Uh, my wife doesn't necessarily agree, um, I'm, or my kids, but I'm glad to be able to still be here with you and be able to minister the Word of God. Although listening to that text being read, I'm like, why do I come back on tongues and prophecy? Um, but, you know, we'll get to walk through that. I also want to take a minute and welcome the McGregor family. They're sitting right here to my left. Those of you watching for live stream won't be able to see. Cameras aren't, aren't able to move. But Mike McGregor is beginning his ministry this week as director of college, uh, uh, director of our college ministry. His wife Kelly is here. Also Anna Kate and Jackson and Johnny and their photos up there. Sweet picture for those of you watching from li live stream. So do. Uh, reach out to them and welcome them, and actually Mike is going to close our service this morning in prayer, uh, which he found out yesterday, so I'm grateful for his uh, flexibility. So uh, why, why don't we go to the Lord now in prayer. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy to us in Christ. I'm grateful for uh, the time that you give us, Lord. I'm grateful for the way that you spared my life two weeks ago. I'm grateful for the excellent medical care that I received. I'm grateful Oh, Lord, for every day that we have in this world together, uh, Lord, we know that we are taught in Scripture and by the Spirit to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Our time here is brief. It is brief. It is unique. It is a time to suffer, a time to struggle, a time to put sin to death, a time to show valor and courage in the ministry of the Word. None of those things will happen in heaven. There will be no need for any of those things in heaven, but now is the time that you call us to stand firm and to grow and to suffer and to walk with you and to walk with each other. Uh, and so I pray that you would strengthen us as a local church as we continue in this uh, strange era that we're in now with the pandemic. We pray that we continue to look for opportunities to share the gospel. I do want to pray for the Blaylock family, for Brian uh, and for Stacy, as you continue to give good care to him. We pray that you would just help that family to navigate through this uh, trial that they're going through uh, as he receives chemotherapy. We just pray for strength for him. Uh, Father, we pray for the McGregor family as they begin with us. We're grateful for them being here. We look forward to um, his ministry going forward and Kelly's as well, a ministry of the word, of hospitality, of evangelism on college campuses in this area. Thank you that you positioned our church strategically, surrounded by some of the great institutions of learning in the world. And Lord, we thank you for him being here to um, be able to minister that. We're grateful uh, for his family. And Father, we pray now as we turn our attention to your word, <clears throat> pray that you would give me wisdom. Help me, O oh Lord, to think clearly, to, uh, to explain clearly the word, which is really the central point of this text. The ministry of the word clearly unfolded to the body builds the body up. And I pray that you would you know, grant me that grace even now as we walk through a difficult topic, difficult passage, a chapter, uh, in which we will probably have a little less certainty than we usually do in some texts of Scripture. We just pray that you, through the Spirit, would minister. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We continue our study in this incredible epistle, 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've completed multiple sermons in 1 Corinthians 13. Now we get to chapter 14. And as we do, we need to understand the overall context as we're unfolding 1 Corinthians. Uh, we're in the midst of a three-chapter section on spiritual gifts that Paul began in chapter 12 on through chapter 13. The love chapter also really has to do with spiritual gifts and how they're used, and that if gifts are not ministered in love, then they really are ultimately damaging. Uh, they result in nothing beneficial at all if the spiritual gifts are not used in love. And now we transition to a focus on tongues and on prophecy. Now we need to understand the big picture all the time. We need to understand this in life, that the reason that we exist, the reason that anything exists, is for the glory of God. That God created the universe out of nothing for his own glory. And that when we get to heaven, the, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, we're going to be radiant with the glory of God. And what is the glory of God but the radiant display of the attributes of God, the perfections of God, what kind of God he is. His power, his mercy, his grace, his justice, those attributes on radiant display. And I say to you that nothing displays the glory of God more clearly than the perfection of the church of Jesus Christ through the redemption 
accomplished by Jesus on the cross and applied by the Spirit in every generation, that is the most glorious work there is. And it's an ongoing work. It's a work in progress. Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And so that work of ongoing building of the church of Jesus Christ is glorious in every generation. It's also very imperfect because he's, it's a partnership ministry between the Holy Spirit and unglorified saints who have sin natures and who mess up and who don't fully understand doctrines properly and who don't live out what they know properly. And, and so when we come to tongues, tongues and prophecy, we come to a controverted area. We come to things where people who are genuine believers in Christ don't agree with each other. And so we end up needing, needing uh, humility and needing wisdom to come and ask God, is there a way that our church could grow and develop in some of these areas? Are we seeing some things wrongly? And uh, it's interesting, an analogy that hit me this morning, and uh, I've been thinking about it, I don't know if it's a perfect analogy, but it's amazing how when a blood vessel is blocked, God opens up other blood vessels and delivers the nutrients and the oxygen often to the brain or to other parts when, when that is blocked. And so you take a local church, and we would not say that the local church has to have a perfect understanding of all the spiritual gifts in order to be a healthy church being uh, fruitful. And so we're going to see this morning over the next couple of weeks, God willing, how there are different definitions of the gift of prophecy. How do we understand it? What is it? And it could very well be that God delivers the goods through the Spirit, even if those people don't call that gift the proper name. That could be. It's, we're going to find out a lot of these things. So the irony here this morning is the, the basic concept is edification through clarity in the Word. That's what we're looking at. The body of Christ being built up by a clear speaking of the word of God. And that's superior over unintelligible speaking. And someone once said a long time ago, as I've studied preaching, I continue to study it, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. So I was a little insecure this morning as I'm continuing even this very morning to think new thoughts about prophecy and continuing to learn. So uh, ironically, I don't want to be unclear as I talk to you this morning in 1 Corinthians 14. It's a continued work in progress. So the simple doctrine that we're stating here is edification. The body of Christ, the church of Christ being edified. He says it again and again. Look at verse 3. Uh, It says, the person who prophesies speaks to people for edification, encouragement, and consolation. It's one translation. Uh, Again, in verse 5, he says, he who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. If your eye goes down to verse 12, you're going to see the same thing. So it is with you, since you're eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up or edify the church. And again, verse 17, you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. So the spiritual gifts are given for that purpose. Now, what is edification? Well, it means a building up or a constructing of the church. And so uh, we have a very good practical illustration in terms of the more than a building um, uh, program and 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 the renovations that have been going on in our building Um, Those of us that have continued to work here and are here every week have seen, even in this room, the sanctuary, massive changes over the last five months. So at one point, you could have come in here and every square inch basically was taken up with scaffolding as they were painting the ceiling. And they'd removed all the pews and, and all the scaffolding was in. It took them a week to set up the scaffolding. Incredible. Massive undertaking. And so, I don't know if I was allowed to or not, but I slipped in here on a Saturday, went up to the top, was able to look around, it's pretty cool. I mean, that's a high ceiling, it's up there. Um, And able to look, and and by the way, friends, in case you don't know, that's where it all started. There was an area there that needed painting, and they said, well, the only way we're gonna do that is to remove the pews, and it was like the layers of the onion, it kept getting bigger and bigger. At some point, we had to say, okay, that's enough renovation, that's what we're going to do. But that's, that's really the idea that you should have when it comes to spiritual gifts. They are scaffolding, they're temporary construction uh, avenues by which the real work can happen, and that is the building up of the body of Christ. As these skilled workers have come in, uh, so we're talking about plumbers, electricians, painters, carpenters at, at all different levels, uh, following a, a pattern laid out by the architect and all that, that's a picture that we have of the body of Christ. 
and the body of Christ is likened to a spiritual structure in Ephesians 2, one of my, the texts I've quoted the most in my preaching ministry, Ephesians 2, 21, 22, says, in Christ the whole building is joined together and rises to become holy temple in the Lord, and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So there is this spiritual structure, this spiritual temple being built. And as I've reached again and again over to 1 Peter where we have the image in chapter 2 of living stones, these are individual human beings who are redeemed, they are rescued out of Satan's dark kingdom, and they are like living stones in the wall of the spiritual structure as it rises, that's a dynamic word, to become a holy temple in which God dwells by his spirit. That's the building project going on in every generation. So it really ultimately has to do with evangelism slash missions, and discipleship or pastoral ministry. So individuals are rescued, redeemed. They're set in the wall as a living stone, but the work goes on in them. They are polished and kind of continue to be quarried while they're set in the wall. That's the picture of justification. You're perfect in Christ, but sanctification, you're made more nearly perfect in conformity to Christ. Those things are going on. That's the edification. Now, how does that happen? It happens by the clear ministry of the Word of God both formally and informally, in the life of the church, the word of God is just flowing, and the spiritual gifts are delivery systems for that ministry of the word. It's a beautiful picture, and it's temporary, but that's the edification that's going on. Now let's take a, a step back and look at the Corinthian context. All right, we're in chapter 14 now in 1 Corinthians. The, first, uh, the Corinthian church was a local church in Corinth, you know, about 30 miles southwest, I think, of Athens, Paul planted the church along with some other co-workers there. You can read about it in Acts 18. That's how the church is planned. This local church, genuine church of Jesus Christ, was badly dysfunctional. All kinds of messed upness, if that's a word. And this messed up church, Paul is addressing in 1 and 2 Corinthians, and it's much to the benefit of 20 centuries of other messed up local churches, of which every one of them is in some way messed up. So that we can see the problems. You've got factions and divisions along human lines. People following certain key leaders. You've got worldliness. You've got problems with sin that should have been addressed by church discipline. Sexual immorality. Uh, You've got problems with lawsuits among believers. People taking each other to court. Bad witness. You've got problems with sexual immorality. People visiting temple prostitutes. You've got problems with marriage dysfunction in marriage, a bad understanding of marriage and singleness. You get problems, and Paul addresses it in three chapters with meat sacrifice to idols as they've recently come out of paganism, and they don't know exactly how to deal with that in the life of the Christian church. Three chapters, and they get problems with, with the role of women in the church. They get problems with the Lord's Supper. Now, in chapters 12 through 14, problems with spiritual gifts. So what was going on from their pagan background Uh, In paganism, there was often a sense of of spirituality through frenzy, through acting crazy. We actually, some of that still, it's like, man, that's crazy, means good, means amazing, like at a high level. But that idea of, of you're being touched by the divine when you're out of your mind. And so you go almost like in the Muslim uh, you got whirling dervishes or this kind of thing. You got just a mindless frenzy, a chaotic experience, which proves that those individuals, this was in paganism, were touched by gods and goddesses. Well, then comes the gospel and speaking in tongues and all that, and that gift got elevated and zeroed in on in the Corinthian church because it was a touch with the divine. It was. Uh, uh, and, and there was a sense of mindlessness and a sense of chaotic, weird behavior that was so awesome and amazing. Paul has to rectify that. He's basically got to explain tongues and put tongues in its place. And so that's what he's doing here. Now, our context, we're 21st century evangelicals, part of a denomination in which uh, at, the, at the highest level, the leadership level historically has been hostile to the sign gifts Uh, The charismatic gifts, the charismatic movement started in the Azusa Street Revival, modern charismatic movement, 1905. 
uh, Pentecostal movement. And so I've, I've been through all this. I'm not going to review all this, but in 1 Corinthians 12, there's sermons in which I lay this out. But just quickly by way of review, there are charismatics, so the people that believe the sign gifts, speaking in tongues, prophecy, miracles, those things uh, are still functioning today. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got cessationists who believe that those gifts ended with the end of the first century when the New Testament was completed. Uh, those gifts are done, those particular spiritual gifts, so tongues, prophecy, uh, miracles, the gift of, uh, you know, the role of being an apostle, those things uh, have been fulfilled. And then you have people in the middle who are like, um, they're not charismatics, they've not personally used the gifts like that, they're not willing, they're not cessationists because they either strongly don't see cessationism in the New Testament or they just haven't studied it much and they haven't experienced it. So you've got a kind of a wide range of open but cautious people, that's generally the phrase given to them. There could be some open but skeptical people in there somewhere. I mean, you got all kinds of range in the middle from the extremes of charismatics to cessationists. Now, in my years, uh, 22, almost 22 years at FBC, I've never had anyone come and advocate an expansion of the sign gifts in Sunday morning worship. So we need to have tongues and prophecy working on Sunday morning. No one is advocating that. You could say, Pastor, until now, wait till you see what happens over the next number of weeks. So we'll see. We'll have that, that interesting conversation. But we've never done that in 22 years. However, I do know there are individuals who practice private prayer languages because you've told me so. And there are other individuals that are ardent cessationists because you've told me so. And we're doing local church together. Um, my own mentors are, are and my, my highest level mentors are divided on this topic. So you got Jonathan Edwards and John MacArthur on one side, they're just straight cessationists. They believe that those gifts ended with the completion of the New Testament and they make, um, you know, they make a, a case from that. Um, they seek to do it uh, biblically from 1 Corinthians 13, but I've shown that that's, I think that's not valid. I've already been through all that. Um, uh, on the other side, you got John Piper, who's, uh, I would say, charismatic on this, believes in the gift of prophecy and tongues still functioning. And he and Wayne Grudem and others give new definitions to prophecy, which are worth at least considering. They're weighty. We have to understand them, et cetera. So that's uh, the spectrum. I can speak for the elders, I think, on this, that we are not likely to make any significant changes in Sunday morning worship anytime soon. If you think differently, if you're an elder and you think differently, tell me, tell me later. But I, you know, I, I think we talked about this quite recently. And I think both of us, all of us feel that on both of these gifts, tongues and prophecy, there's some reasonable biblical tests that would have to be passed for us to see that functioning in the life of the church. For example, tongues, which is just another way of saying this King James, uh, just languages, we would have to be hearing a language. I've been all over the world. I've been, I've been in wor worship services all over the world. I know what Paul's talking about when he says, my mind is unfruitful. You can go through a whole worship service in China or India, or whatever, and you're just thinking your own thoughts. I would just go over scripture memory verses or different things because you just don't understand anything that's being said. Except, and I'll mention this later, an occasional amen or hallelujah. So I got that. Um, but other than that, I have no idea what's being said. So that, that's what tongues, tongues are languages. I can hear a language I don't know at all but recognize it as a language and make a distinction between that and gibberish. And gibberish is just repeated empty phrases and patterns that can be learned. And so, however, just because there are fraudulent versions of tongues and fraudulent versions of interpretation of tongues doesn't mean the gift itself has ceased or has ended. You just have to be a more careful thinker about that. But there are fraudulent uh, displays, etc. And on prophecy, I continue to believe that the Deuteronomy 18 test of being able to predict the future in order to validate the prophetic gift is still biblical and reasonable. And so I'll talk more about that later in the message. Uh, but there may be other ways of defining or understanding prophecy um, that we might want to try to understand. And, and in those sense, if that's a delivery system, for example, Piper, uh, John Piper says that pro prophecy is just the delivery of God's wisdom and truth into a circumstance. So I, it just sounds like wisdom to me. And it says in James 1, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God who goes generously to all without finding fault. And not only that, there are individuals within the life of the church, both men and women, who are just consistently giving wise counsel and you go to them for wise counsel 
and you get it again and again, and they're identified as wise people or counsel givers, but we don't call them prophets or prophetesses. When we get to heaven, we'll get all this sorted out. But God may well be delivering the wisdom he needs to cessationist local churches so they're able to function well and do what they need to do in mission and able to send out missionaries and do things strategically well in their community while they the whole time don't believe that the gift of prophecy is continuing. And guess what it is? But they just call it something else. So that's what we're dealing with in 1 Corinthians 14. By the way, I'm planning on preaching three sermons in this chapter. You may notice a difference in pace in 1 Corinthians 14 from 13. So just that's what's going to happen, God willing. So we're not going to be real slow uh, going through this, but we're going to continue to look at it. So let's let's look at the uh, exegesis of 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 19. Uh, And the second point in my outline, prophecy edifies the whole congregation, verses 1 through 5. Prophecy edifies the whole congregation. So Paul strongly elevates prophecy over tongues. The basic concept here is this. Tongues untranslated are unintelligible to the local church. Prophecy, by contrast, is clear to everyone and therefore is superior. Because what really edifies the church is the clear delivery of the word of God. That's Paul's basic point in these verses. All right, now he begins in verse one, commanding the church to pursue love and to pursue spiritual gifts. Look at verse one. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So the word, the Greek word here, pursue, means uh, to follow after ardently or to hunt, like hunt down, chase after with focus and intensity. So go after love as I've defined it. First Corinthians 13, we walked through that. We know that we don't love perfectly. We know we could grow in love. So pursue that. Ardently pursue love and pursue spiritual gifts. Go after spiritual gifts. And then, especially that you may prophesy. Now here's the thing, if you're not a cessationist, this ends up becoming troubling if you're kind of a open but skeptical church where you're not not using prophecy, you have to say, okay, should we be pursuing prophecy? And how do we do that? And that's, you know, that's an important question, but at any rate, this is what the verse says. Some people interpret this as saying, esteem all the spiritual gifts, and especially esteem prophecy because of its, its impact. Others argue, they say, look, if God gives spiritual gifts as he wills, then why should you pursue it? He's going to give you what you're going to give, get, so what, what benefit is there to pursue a gift, let's say, you don't have? So should we be pursuing gifts we don't have? So, you know, I've always wanted the gift of evangelism, and nothing excites me more than be able to be there when someone crosses over from death to life. I mean, that's got to be the coolest gift, but... You know, it's maybe a grass is greener syndrome where others say, I would love to be able to just unfold the word of God and feed people week after. So I think we need to be content with what we have. But suppose you look at your gift package and you're like, man, it would be awesome if that one more gift were added. Is it valid, biblically valid, to pursue a gift you don't have? Now, early in my Christian life, I thought whatever gifts you're going to get, you get at conversion. Bang. So it's kind of like you're uh, a recruit at boot camp and they slide a a group of things across a table to you, and that's what you have. However, the more I've carefully studied, uh, I'd see no time orientation for the giving of spiritual gifts. It could happen any time. There's no verse that links it to conversion. So you could get gifts that you then discover and develop and use, or you could have another gift that's added to you as you step out in faith and go on a mission trip. Something you never needed before, but now the Holy Spirit opens up an ability. We'll never know if you had it all along but weren't using it or if it was given you then, then there's no Bible verses about it either way. Beyond that, I don't think it's wrong to pursue something that God gives. I actually think this is the normal pattern in the Christian life. You read something in Scripture that you consider a good thing, you don't have it, and you pursue it from the hand of God in prayer. Take biblical marriage, for example. Let's say you're a single man or woman, right? Uh, we know it says in Proverbs 19:14, a prudent wife is from the Lord. You get houses and wealth inherited from your parents, but prudent wife comes from the Lord. So it's like, well, I don't need to seek her. I don't, you know, God's going to give her or he won't. That kind of, that's, no one should act like that. And if you ever, you know, you're older men in the church, that there's every young man like that just coasting, would like to be married, but is not doing anything about it. You're saying, look, pursue her in prayer. Pursue her generally, 
Now in your prayer life, oh God, if it be your will and you want me to be married, bring a godly woman in my life. Secondly, once you start finding somebody, etc., you're going to pursue her in godly courtship, etc. There is an effort being made, but she's still a gift from God. So I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, pursuing a spiritual gift. And then he says, especially prophecy over tongues. Paul is saying the Corinthians should be especially zealous after the gift of prophecy. Why? Look at verses two through four. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So again, the whole goal here, as I've said, is edification of the church, building up to maturity. The unintelligible, uninterpreted tongues are essentially, Paul says, mysterious to everyone, even to the person who speaks them. Now, in some way... A person who's speaking in a tongue he or she has never studied is edified somewhat, Paul says, in themselves because they're having a supernatural experience that they know wouldn't be happening to them if they were not a Christian, if they didn't have the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul means when he says he edifies himself. Um, But, he says, prophecy is superior because it's intelligible to everyone who hears it and therefore edifies the whole church. Now we need to stop and try to understand what prophecy is. What do we mean by prophecy? Now, in the Old Testament, to me, it's very clear that prophecy is the delivery of the word of God through a human being, male or female. There are women prophets and men prophets in the Old Testament as there are in the New Testament. So through a prophet or prophetess, the individual is able to say, thus says the Lord, or an oracle from the Lord, and out comes a packet of words uh, or truths that are directly from God. Thus says the Lord. That's, that's prophecy. Now, the content in that could be anything, could be anything. Um, It could refer to any time aspect, could refer to past, present, or future. We believe that all of the written word of God are prophecies that were ministered through prophets. The whole Bible is a prophetic book. But when Moses wrote Genesis, he was writing about the past. It was a prophecy about the past. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It had already happened, but he was prophesying about it. So prophecy, we tend to think of it only future, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's really anything. Current events could be, I mean, the the Old Testament prophets were constantly talking about current events, about issues of injustice and morality. Think about John the Baptist. He clearly stated to Herod that it was sin for him to take his brother's wife. Got him killed. It was a current event. So prophets did that, past, present, and future. However... The prediction of future events is unique in prophecy. It's set apart as unique. It's highlighted, especially in the book of Isaiah, as unique. And so I can say, and I've said many times before, prediction of the future sets the Judeo-Christian heritage apart from any other religion in the world. There is no other religion that has this feature. And I only add Judeo because that's up until the time of Christ in that the Jewish nation rejected Jesus and rejected Christ as the fulfillment of those prophecies, the Christian church is almost on its own now as as a prophetic entity in the world. We believe in predictions that have been fulfilled in Jesus and predictions that have yet to be fulfilled. We're looking ahead to prophecies. It sets Christianity apart from Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, any other religion. Not only that, it sets the individual who does it apart as a prophet. In Deuteronomy 18, um, 21, 22, Moses wrote this. Uh, this is God speaking. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has, been, has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. So I am asserting here that for any local church to identify an individual as a prophet or prophetess, it is right for us to ask that this be done. That, that independently verifiable predictions of the future be made. And this did happen in the New Testament. Agabus, in Acts 11, predicted that a famine would come over the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled in the reign of Claudius. That kind of thing. You can't predict something that's going to happen in 70 years like Jeremiah did with the return of the Jews because that'll be 70 years of us not knowing you're a prophet. 
So there has to be something that comes up very, very soon so we can identify that gift. Now, uh, John Piper, Wayne Grudem, and other more modern, they have a, more, a broader definition of prophecy. It was, as I've said, more of a delivery of the, word of, of the will of God in a certain situation, what I would call wise counsel or stra- strategic decisions about missions or about other things. That again, from James 1 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God. They call that prophecy, and then therefore, what you're looking for is a consistent pattern of wise counsel being given. They look on that as uh, prophecy as well. Beyond that, however, all sides agree on this that whatever is prophetically uttered must line up with the existing revelation of the Word of God. Now, back then it was a work in progress, the New Testament hadn't been completed. And uh, so, th- so, what Paul says in Romans 12 6, he says, um, if someone's gift is prophecy, let him use it in accordance or in proportion to the faith. Analogia. Uh, sometimes people just transliterate that over into the analogy of faith. But what it means is it's got to line up with the doctrine that we've already received from the Bible. So if anyone speaks false doctrine, they are a false teacher or a false prophet. And they uh, must be uh, eliminated. It's got to be... So, Two tests then, predicting of the future that's verified, and then everything that's uttered is biblically true or accurate. That's how you would filter a prophet. Beyond that, is it necessary for a church that has godly counsel givers, both men and women, who speak clear words of wisdom and discretion to be identified as prophets or prophetesses? Maybe so, because this word is given us, and it could be we are defective in that, in that way, not identifying them as such, etc. So for me, uh, verse 1, where it says pursue prophecy means study more and keep praying. So we'll move on to, from the definition. What is the purpose? What should pr- uh, prophecy do? Look at verse 3. The person who prophesies speaks to the people for, one translation gives, edification, encouragement, and consolation. These are the three functions of good prophecy back in Paul's day. Edification is the building up to maturity of the individual bodies of Christ, uh, uh, individual members of the body of Christ, and of that local church, and universally of the church as a whole. Edification, as we mentioned. Secondly, encouragement or exhortation. This is more application-oriented, where you, you hear the truth clearly unfolded, you, get, you find out what it is, then you're exhorted to live accordingly. You're you're warned even maybe to live accordingly. So that's the exhortation aspect. Jesus said in John 13, 17, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. So that's exhortation. And then beyond that, consolation. Uh, Consolation or comfort. This world is hard. There's a lot of suffering that goes on. There's a lot of persecution in some regions in the world, in some different times in the world, far more than for us now. It's a hard life. It is through many hardships that we must enter the kingdom of God. And so the prophets are able to speak a word of consolation or comfort. Again, Jesus leads the way in everything. But in John 16, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's the ministry of consolation. So those three things are done by the prophets. I would say they're also done by good preachers today and good teachers of the word of God. If you want to be a good teacher of the word of God, do those three things. Edify by instruction, by careful instruction. Exhort to a life change and console or comfort the people on their way to heaven. I think that's just good preaching teaching. By the way, the Puritans called preaching prophesying. So they, they believed that that was prophesying. So I'm not saying because they did it, it's right. It's just that's how they interpreted that gift. So that is the clear superiority of prophecy over tongues. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Now, big picture in this chapter, Paul is not throwing the gift of tongues under the bus. He's not denigrating it. He's just trying to put it in its place. They had elevated it too high and misunderstood it. So he wants to put it, put it in his, uh, he's not throwing tongues under the bus. Look at verse 5. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. It reminds me of when Moses said, would that all God's people were the prophets, that kind of thing. Now, he's not, he, he himself is going to say in verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Talk more about that in a minute. But he's clearly not denigrating tongues because he says he does it. It's not a bad thing. Neither is he questioning how the Spirit is apportioning the gifts. I wish the Spirit would get on the ball and give everyone the gift of tongues. He's not saying that either. 
He's saying, I'm just, I'm very pro gift of tongues. But I'm just saying prophecy is better for the edification of the body. That's what he's saying. He who prophesies, he says, is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so the church may be edified, verse 5. Now, point three, we have the problem of unintelligibility. Paul heightens his argument here in the problem of the unintelligibility of tongues if they're not translated. And he does it by means of some everyday life illustrations. So Paul says, look, even if I myself came and did that, I would be of no benefit to you. Look at verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good would I be to you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Those are clear deliveries of the word of God. That's what he's saying. So imagine how frustrating that would be. Paul coming back to Corinth. We get the author of the book of Romans coming to preach our sermon today. We get the, I mean, just the greatest doctrinal mind in the history of the church. And he comes and does that, speaks in tongues, you know, for 20, 30 minutes and never, and then sits down. How frustrating would that be? You wanted a clear word from the Lord. You wanted clear instruction. So he said, even if I were the one to come do it, it would be of no advantage. Unless I come and do edification, exhortation, consolation. So he uses two illustrations. First, musical instruments. Verse 7. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tongue is, uh, sorry, what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? So I've cleared this with Wes. We've talk, I don't know music. I love music. I appreciate music. But even me with an untrained ear, I can tell the difference between someone like Micah who sits down and plays beautifully and a child that's big enough to sit on the bench and bang on the keys. You can hear it from the other room. Oh, a child is banging on the keys, your brain tells you. There's no chord progression. Frankly, there's no chords. There's a bunch of sounds. There's no time signature. There's no progression. There's no musical story being unfolded. But, you know, any other pattern of music, even if you don't like it, it still has rules. Even jazz has rules, Wes told me. There are certain rules, all right? And your ear hears it. And it's pretty awesome when you think about it. I believe that the brain is wired to accept good music and hear it as beautiful. And I think there's a portion of our souls waiting to hear a new pattern of music that no human has ever heard up in heaven. It's going to be incredible. The new song. But meanwhile, we can identify musical wisdom or musical science and musical logic. We can hear it in all patterns or styles of music. The second illustration he gives is of a trumpet in battle. Look at verse 8. Again, if the trumpet sound does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So in the military, let's say in the Civil War, units would learn trumpet signals that would tell them what to do in the midst of a battle. Whether to advance, retreat, turn left, turn right, these were very important. It was the way that the commanders could somewhat keep control in the chaos of a battle. And we know some of those sounds, even if you've never been in the military, you know the sound of reveille or taps. You know what the, those things, I'm not going to hum them. But you know what reveille sounds like. You know what tap sounds like. Even though you've never been in the military, it tells you it's time to get up. It's time to go to bed. So also in World War II, the citizens of, of London during the Blitz, when the Luftwaffe was going over London, they had two different sirens, one for get in, co in, in the cover now, and the other is all clear. You can return to your normal life. You definitely need to know the difference between the two. And they did. So if, if the signals are not clear, then how will any soldier know what to do on the battlefield, he's saying? In the same way, verse 9, so it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You'll just be speaking into the air. Now, as he talks about this, he needs to clarify something about, about tongues, about languages. Look at verse 10, 11. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying to me, I'm a foreigner to the speaker, and he's a foreigner to me. So no true language is gibberish. We can tell the difference between repeated phrases again and again and an actual language that has a wide range of sounds but that are cohesive, and you just don't know it. But even if it's a cohesive, logical, clear 
language. If you don't know that language, you get nothing out of what's being communicated. For you, uh, with the untrained ear, uh, it's like a foreigner is speaking to you. The Greek word here is barbarian, and the word is li- literally barbar. It's like that's what it was like, bar, 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 bar. You know, it's people imitating a language they can't speak. I remember coming back from the mission field in Japan, and I had gotten functionally conversational in Japanese, but I was working in a certain area that apparently didn't get across the county line very much or something like that, and they were trying to do uh, wang, 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 wang. It's like, well, that's not what Japanese sounds like, friend. But anyway, that was just a moment that I had with that. But they were trying to imitate Japanese. But to you, it is effectively gibberish if it doesn't uh, communicate meaning. So he repeats the point for emphasis in verse 12. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. Point number four, the goal of worship then is a fruitful mind resulting in a fruitful spirit, a combination of mind and spirit. That's what we're looking for. Verse 13, for this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. Now, I, I think in, in chapter 12, it could be a different person. In it. One, one speaks in a tongue, the other interprets. In this case, it seems like it'd be good if you could do your own interpretation. That may be possible. Uh, but in any case, you need the, somebody needs to do the interpretation. Uninterpreted tongues, Paul says, make the mind unfruitful. Verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now, this would probably be the number one key, I have a private prayer language text in the Bible. Verse 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. An individual is praying in tongues, their mind is unfruitful, but they're communicating in some way uh, to God. Now, some people, the cessationists say that's completely invalid. Paul is making another point or he's being sarcastic. They do different things with the text. But Alistair Begg points out very helpfully, later Paul's going to say, look at verse 18, 19, how much he speaks in tongues. He said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words so as to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, Alistair Begg asks, if Paul's not using his gift in the church, then when is he using it? When is he speaking more than anyone else? And it must be in his own private prayer closet, something like that. That's the way he argues. There are different ways to interpret this text, even than what Alistair Begg said. Oh, the interpretations never end. I will say this. If you speak in a private prayer language, I don't have any verses to contradict you. I am commending these verses actually to encourage the practice uh, and not shut it down. I don't personally know whether it's valid or not, but I know this. Nothing I say in 24 seconds is going to convince you that, it's, that what you're doing is not from God anyway. But at any rate, there is some indication here that Paul prayed in a tongue he didn't always understand. That seems to be what's going on here. But in any case, Paul's main point here is his mind is unfruitful during that time. He doesn't know what he's saying. True worship then must be a combination of the mind and the spirit. Verse 15, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I also sing with my mind. So this is just how it works in sanctification and in worship. The mind understands the word of God. The spirit is warmed up or heated up. The heart is heated up and loves and engages. And then the worship flows out through the body. Mind, spirit slash heart, body. That's how it works in the Christian life. Everything starts with the mind and with the word of God. Jesus himself said with the Samaritan woman about the perfect combination, this is what worship is, John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So we could reverse it, truth first, the word of God and faith comes by hearing the word, in comes the word, your heart is transformed and then out, out it goes in singing and prayer, praise and living. That's how sanctification happened. That's how worship uh, happens. So we want a combination in our corporate worship of mind and spirit. We want light and heat. First the light, then the heat. You don't just want light. You don't just want heat. Maybe you've been to a service in which there was just heat and you didn't know what everyone's heated up about. I don't think they knew either. You don't want that. But you don't want to be in a cold, formal, orthodox service in which you're getting all of the doctrine right and there's just no joy or zeal or energy. It's got to be both. Spirit and truth. Alistair Begg puts it this way. You don't want the carnival on the one side or the crematorium on the other. I thought that was helpful. So you want a beautiful combination of mind and heart. 
So that's our goal in Sunday morning worship. Without intelligibility, he says, how can we say amen? Look at verse 16 and 17. If, those, if you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. As I mentioned earlier, amen in different, trans, different uh, pronunciations is like the one word that's made it worldwide. Everywhere you go, people say a version of it. It's a Hebrew word means effectively I stand on. It's related to the Hebrew word for stand, but it, it's translated when Jesus said, amen, amen, it's truly, truly. So you're saying what I'm hearing, I say true. I stand on that, I agree with you. And that's what corporate worship is all about. Truth gets rolled out and everyone around says, yes, amen. I love it, that's what I want. That's what we do together. And he realizes, God, the Holy Spirit is working the same thing. That's why he says in 1 John, you have an unction or anointing from the Spirit, and all of you knows the truth. I don't write you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. Well, John, why are you writing if we already know the truth? I didn't say you didn't, couldn't learn. What I am saying is, when you hear the truth, the Holy Spirit enables you to identify it as truth, and you celebrate. It's like, yes, that's good. And that's what corporate worship is all about, that amen. You say it together. But if you don't understand what's going on, you can't do it. You can't say amen, and you can't delight in it. So, unintelligible words are worthless. Verse 18, 19, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, Paul's own use of the gift of tongues is established here and nowhere else in the Bible. Nowhere else. We don't even get it in his baptism account like you do in other baptism accounts. But Paul says, I do. I speak in tongues more than anybody else. He's identifying with those with the gift of tongues, but he's saying, look, when I come for corporate worship, what I want is to speak five clear words rather than 10,000 unintelligible words. Like five clear words can change your life. Jesus rose from the dead. Change your life. But 10,000 words in gibberish? Now, my Microsoft Word counted the words in my sermon up to this point, 5,000. So we'd be halfway through 10,000 words of gibberish. I think many of you would have walked out by then. You're like, what in the world was that? So Paul's saying it's just clearly what we need is intelligibility. And I'd rather speak five clear words than 10,000 words in an untranslated tongue. Application, first and foremost, let everything that we do here on Sunday morning be for edification. That's the goal. Every spiritual gift, everything would be for the upbuilding, the strengthening of the body of Christ. This is what is being built here, not the physical building. This, be this building's beautiful. It's ready to go, God willing. If the Lord tarries another X number of decades, we believe it. It's, it's, but, but buildings, all buildings are temporary. Everything physical is temporary. The real building project here is the church of Jesus Christ. So let everything be done for edification. Second of all, esteem in your hearts, the clear unfolding of the word of God. Esteem this in your heart. Understand what clarity is all about. In the book of Revelation, we've got so many clear verses, you know. It says that the, before the throne of God was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Clear as crystal. That's where we're going. We're going to a, a new Jerusalem, which will, Revelation 21, 11, shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. And then the river of the water of life is gonna flow right down through the center of the city, clear as crystal. Everything's clear, and it just shines. So what you want is God's word, a lamp to your feet, a light to your path, shining clearly through the ministry of the word, and not just through the sermon, not just at Sunday morning worship. But in all of the formal and informal teaching ministry of the church, it's all about clarity, a delivery of the truth. And that's what you should seek. There are a lot of people that that's not what they do when they get up in the pulpit. It's not. There are a lot of charlatans, a lot of people that are tickling the ears. But my job should be to make the word of God clear. I love this story of Charles Spurgeon. He was the most, probably one of the most eloquent, language-gifted people in the history of the English language. He knew he could blow people away with his vocabulary. But what he did frequently was he had a, a young woman, a maid, not highly educationally trained, that would listen to one of his sermons before he preached it. I don't know if she was trained to raise her hands like, okay, what was that? <laughs> and he would just circle and just zero in and say, okay, I gotta make that clear. 
There's no point in me getting up here and not being clear with the word of God. So you should, you should never settle for anything less than a clear unfolding of the scripture from the pulpit ministry. Concerning pro- uh, prophecy in tongues, I can't finally render a verdict on whether they're still functioning in the same way they were in the first century. That's a matter for study. I'm confident that God will use our dysfunctional church like he's used every other dysfunctional church in every generation of church history. But the more functional we can be, the better. So let's keep praying, let's keep studying. Uh, No matter what you personally believe about prophecy and tongues, the elders will seek to be wise about what we do Sunday mornings, follow the rules that are given here in this chapter. Tongues will never be used unless they're interpreted. We'll talk more about that, God willing, over the next two weeks. Prophecy, we're gonna keep studying it, but fundamentally we're gonna keep preaching and teaching the word and giving wise counsel. We're not likely to have an open mic anytime soon, um, but that's where we're at. Finally, the most important thing I can ever do is to exhort any that are listening to me, I mean by live stream or sitting here, who have not yet come to faith in Christ to trust in Jesus. The clearest word I can give you is that God sent his son to die on the cross for sinners like you and me. You are a sinner, so am I. If you don't have Christ as a savior, you will perish, you will die eternally. But if you know him and love him and trust in him, all your sins will instantly be forgiven and you'll have eternal life. That's the clearest thing I can say to you. So today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, but trust in Jesus. Close with me in prayer. Lord, thank you for the time we've had to study in 1 Corinthians 14. Thank you for um, the things that you've taught us. There's so many things to learn. Father, I pray that you'd strengthen each one of us in your word, help us to understand what's said here and be able to walk in it and to be healthy as a church. I pray that you'd help all of the spiritual gifts to be used as you intend and wherein there's any misunderstanding or blockage or hardness of heart on our part. So Lord, we ask that you'd remove it And help us to esteem the spiritual gifts, all of them, not just the showy up front gifts, but all of the gifts that are useful for the building up of the body. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this resource from twojourneys.org. Feel free to use and share this content to spread the knowledge of God and build his kingdom. Only we ask that you do so for non-commercial purposes and in accordance with the copyright policy found at twojourneys.org. Two Journeys exists to help Christians make progress in the two journeys of the Christian life, the internal journey of sanctification and the external journey of gospel advancement. We do this by exporting biblical teaching for the good of Christ's church and for the glory of God.